Hey folks, um, so today I'm going to talk about building GraphQL backends for Angular apps with Hasura. And a uh, little bit of introduction about myself. Uh, I'm Praveen, a uh, senior developer advocate at Hasura. I work across the stack, um, obviously powered by Stack Overflow a bit. Um, my journey has been uh, around uh, beginning with jQuery back when I started uh, full stack development uh, uh, on the front end, I used to use jQuery, but then I moved to this, to the modern framework era where you switch between React, Angular, and Vue. Um, and on the on the backend side, on the MVC framework side of things, uh, I, I, I started with Django, uh, Python, uh, and then I've moved to Node.js. So basically like a JavaScript on the front end and the backend. And obviously for DevOps, uh, I've stick to Docker so far. Uh, the reason why I've gone through this uh, journey is because a um, lot of things changed uh, on the front end and the back end. Uh, but something which didn't change is the API layer, uh, which we've been using for a pretty long time, which is the REST API. Um, and, and throughout the journey, irrespective of what framework you used, Angular, React, or, or anything on the back end, any language on the back end, you still use HTTP, uh, get, post, put, delete APIs, and for all of the CRUD operations that you typically do. And and GraphQL came in, um, and 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 it solved a particular problem pretty neatly. Um, it said that uh, you can now build apps a lot faster, uh, and also for uh, for a use case where you can fetch exactly what you want and like uh, give power to a particular section of developers. Uh, front end developers typically have like the, uh, the bottleneck of uh, how to fetch data, the API access. Typically they, they communicate with backend folks and, and get some APIs and documentation before making the calls. That was a key bottleneck in, in terms of both documentation and communication. Uh, and, and I think GraphQL tried to bridge that gap by empowering front-end developers a little bit more. This was possible by making it a self-served API. Uh, GraphQL is a self-serving API where um, you have documentation available for free uh, and instantly. So as soon as you have a schema, uh, you have your documentation for the API uh, readily available for you to explore. Uh, with GraphQL, you have like uh, different shapes of data that you can ask for, um, and and it's totally under your control on what you want to expose and how do you want to query them from your front end, and that is so that so that makes it flexible as well as powerful for your use cases. And because you can have different shapes of data, uh, it doesn't matter how data is being fetched or where data is being fetched from. So you can have multiple data sources. Uh, this could be a database, your external APIs. Uh, it, it, data can be combined from different sources and the front end developer doesn't need to know where the data is getting fetched from. And obviously all of this combined, the tooling that GraphQL brings in uh, uh, enhances the user experience a lot better uh, overall for, for developing apps pretty quickly. So now, We've seen a little bit of why GraphQL came in uh, into the journey of uh, development. Now we look at why GraphQL matters uh, a lot uh, when compared to what was happening so far with REST APIs. So the, the, there's consumers which have spread across mobile apps, web apps, your microservices and APIs and whatnot, right? Typically your web apps, which is Angular, React or Vue, is what we're currently focusing on, but you have other sites of other side of the app development ecosystem, which is in the mobile and, and so on. Um, and that's where uh, the API layer has to be the same. Um, same meaning the data fetching logic will be shared between those resources, uh, but you currently have to write different sets of APIs for different data fetching logic, right? Um, so data access, takes a lot of time to build and iterate on. The reason being different consumers have different requirements. So you tweak the API layer uh, accordingly for your friend. Um, even in even on a web app 
for example, uh, on a mobile UI, a responsive UI, you might not show all the data. On a desktop UI, you might show a lot more data because the real estate space is, is just generally high. So data access is a big problem to solve. Um, and, and data is, is abundant everywhere. There are producers giving data. Uh, databases are there, uh, different databases for different use cases. We have SQL, NoSQL, and, and like graph databases of late. Uh, and you have internal services, uh, APIs, and SaaS services, right? So databases are getting better. Uh, and everybody's adopting it uh, really quickly. Uh, in, and, and the compute uh, power is also pretty high and, and everybody's writing business logic as well. So is it a comparison between GraphQL versus REST? Um, no, because uh, GraphQL and REST can coexist together and it should coexist together for the foreseeable future. The reason being, you have a lot of existing tooling that you use to work with uh, REST APIs, uh, which will continue to work uh, for your for your future apps. You don't want to rewrite everything from scratch, right? So uh, existing tooling uh, plays a lot of uh, role in, in choosing what your next project will look like and what your stack will look like. And, and, and GraphQL shouldn't be a deterrent for that, uh, right? So enter Hasura. Uh, which gives you GraphQL APIs uh, over data sources. So for example, you have database like Postgres or MySQL uh, or a BigQuery, uh, which is Google and MySQL, so whatever, some SQL data store or a NoSQL data store, uh, which we is going to support in the future. But you have a data source, uh, you connect the data source to Hasura uh, and Hasura basically reads your models and uh, generate CRUD APIs out of the box uh, instantly without you writing any code for it. Uh, this, this opens up a lot of possibilities where um, your core part of the backend is actually replaced by, by APIs that are generated by Hasura for you, right? Um, you can also create REST APIs on top of GraphQL using Hasura. And we'll, we'll probably see that uh, in the demo if possible. Um, and also authorization layer. So with Hasura, you get an authorization layer, which is a permission layer uh, without writing any code. Uh, for example, on your front end, um, in your Angular app, let's say you're fetching data for users, an e-commerce app. You want to be able to fetch cart items of the user who's logged in right now. So uh, there's table called users in your DB, uh, but you want to now fetch user of the uh, logged in one uh, and not everybody else's user, right? So you want to filter that data at the DB layer. And Hasura lets you do that uh, declaratively. You can specify that this, uh, this particular query uh, will actually give me a response uh, suited for this particular user who's logged in. So you will send in the headers and based on the headers, Hasura will give you back the right data. The authorization layer, you have the API layer as well. And you can also join data between different sources, uh, which is to say you have one uh, database and you have an external API, you want to establish some relationship between them, you can do that uh, as well. It's coming soon, but we already have support uh, for a few sources uh, where you can join data between. So how does Hasura fit in your stack right now? Um, so typically in your existing uh, monolith service developers, uh, like let's say you're building your front end app, you, your Angular app basically contacts uh, a monolith service, uh, which in turn contacts databases and services and gives back the data. Uh, with Hasura, what changes is your Angular app now communicates to Hasura in GraphQL interface. Um, and that GraphQL interface is processed by Hasura. Um, depending on what the query looks like, it will send the query to databases. And, and once it's done, uh, it will also do some asynchronous logic in, in microservices, uh, which you can write your own code for <clears throat> in whatever language or framework. And then it, it basically becomes like a CQRS pattern uh, uh, where uh, certain things are blocked on DB and certain things are non-blocked non-blocking and you you delegate it to some serverless function for scaling. A typical example here would be 
you register a user on your front end, uh, your Angular app. You uh, you insert that data into the DB. So you want to write an API. Hasura gives that API for you. And the data gets inserted into the user table. Now, after that, you want to send an email to the user as well, uh, which is not blocking on the UI. So the 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 front end app can actually process the user sign up flow, uh, assuming that email will be sent in the background. Uh, so it's a non-blocking action on the front end, but the email can be triggered later, uh, like maybe a minute or two minutes later, uh, doesn't need to be blocking. Uh, and it can be, that logic can be written in the serverless function. And that that's the pattern that, that Hasura encourages you to do uh, going forward. So now coming back to front end, um, we'll talk about how Angular can leverage GraphQL as well. Um, but in terms of how uh, how any client can request Hasura is basically you directly uh, hit the GraphQL endpoint that Hasura gives you. Uh, and, and there's a lot of client tooling which lets you do that uh, with Angular, it's Angular Apollo, uh, which lets you configure like a simple GraphQL uh, client, uh, which lets you make queries and mutations pretty quickly, uh, pretty easily. But you don't necessarily need to use a GraphQL client uh, in, in Angular. You can simply also use like a fetch API uh, <clears throat> call that you typically use with any JavaScript uh, library as well. So it doesn't need to be um, like a specialized client that you have to use for Angular uh, or for any framework for that matter, for GraphQL. Because at the end of the day, what you do with GraphQL is you send a post request to uh, to a hash to a HTTP endpoint, um, and uh, and you get back a response in JSON. Uh, that's that's most uh, GraphQL implementation providers do these days, uh, including Hasura, uh, which is standard JSON responses and JSON query uh, in in from the front. Um, there are also fluent GraphQL clients which lets you write queries as objects. Uh, these clients are available. Uh, in in React, uh, but I've not seen them uh, in, in the Angular space yet. And I wish to see them because it lets you do queries where um, you write code as objects, you write what data you want, and then the GraphQL query is automatically generated for you in the background instead of you writing the, the GraphQL query uh, by hand, right? So that's going to be an interesting space to watch out for. Um, React has a few clients, but Angular, I think uh, right now you have Angular Apollo, but this will also be a good addition to, to see uh, in terms of writing queries uh, pretty natively. There are obviously challenges around front-end uh, handling GraphQL. The primary challenge would be around caching. How do you cache your data on the browser on the front-end? Uh, how do you handle optimistic updates on the UI when a mutation or a insert happens on the client uh, and so on, right? And and also how do you do real-time data? Um, how do you handle WebSocket connections uh, typically? But with Angular Apollo, you you will be able to, uh, to declare a WebSocket connection um, and then use them for your subscription queries with GraphQL. And GraphQL makes it very easy to consume subscription queries. Uh, so for your real-time use case, that's going to make it very easy for you to, to quickly uh, spin up an app. So let's look at the demo. Um, let's go back to our uh, Hasura Cloud uh, dashboard. So here uh, I have, I've logged into my Hasura Cloud dashboard. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cre uh, create a quick project on on cloud uh, let's call this angular meetup let's click on create project so what i'm going to do is uh, i've i've created a hasura project which will give me a graphql endpoint so for example this particular project has given me this endpoint called angular meetup let me zoom in the screen for folks yeah so this is uh, this has created this endpoint uh, and we'll be using this GraphQL endpoint going forward. Um, and if I've I've not mentioned this before, but with GraphQL, you only get a single endpoint, which you will uh, use to query. 
typically in your uh, in your front end app uh, with rest apis you will declare a list of uh, uh, routes or or api endpoints that you need to call uh, some could be get some could be post uh, methods and what not but with graphql you only have one post endpoint typically uh, and one slash graphql uh, but which, which would be the path that typically is being used for, for the APIs. So we've created the project. Um, uh, this is on, on cloud, but you can also try out Hasra on the open source version, which is available on GitHub. Uh, you can use Docker Compose to set it up or locally, um, right? Um, so I've connected this. Uh, I've, op I've opened the project now. Let's. This is the console. I'm just closing out all of the onboarding stuff. So let's go to data. So the first thing with Hasura is that you have to connect it to a database. Uh, in this particular case, I'm going to just create a new database from scratch on Heroku. Heroku gives you a free Postgres uh, database. So I'm just going to make use of that here. So I've created our database pretty quickly. And Hasura will connect to this database automatically for you. And then you can start creating your data models uh, on top of this data database as well. Right, so now the data source got added successfully. Uh, we can see there is a default data source that gets added here. Uh, we can see the connection stream is coming from an environment variable over here. Awesome, so the next step would be to, uh, to create models. Uh, which will generate APIs that can be used on the Angular app. Um, so before creating the models, I'll just quickly show you the app that uh, I'm going to work on uh, for this app, this backend. Um, this is uh, this is a clone of an Angular uh, Apollo Angular app uh, that's available on this particular repo. I can share this repo as well. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to rewrite this uh, to use a Hasra graphical endpoint, right? Uh, and it will also fetch data from our new Hasra instance rather than this data, which is coming from the Heroku app that uh, this app is currently using. But just quickly uh, on what's happening in this app, uh, you have uh, Apollo Angular as a dependency that, that's installed and that's importing HTTP link and, and so on. And you have an in-memory cache being imported, right? Uh, so what we're doing here is we are creating an Apollo client instance, uh, which will have a HTTP link, which takes an URI import, which is what we've declared over here. This will be the GraphQL endpoint. Eventually we'll replace this with our Hasura GraphQL endpoint. And we also give a, in-memory cache for uh, for the local cache to work, right? So this is what Apollo needs to initialize. Uh, we've given a link, uh, HTTP link, and we've given the graphical endpoint, and we've given the cache parameter. If you want to do a real-time app, uh, instead of this HTTP link, uh, you will import a WebSocket link uh, from Apollo Angular, and then you will be able to use that uh, instead of the HTTP link. Uh, and uh, make real-time queries, which will let you do subscriptions uh, easy, right? Uh, and just going to show what's happening on the list component. You have a UL tag, which is just uh, uh, mapping over the list of posts that are available. Uh, that's what you're seeing over here. And this is what we're going to try to replicate as well. Uh, and there's a query that's going in and we'll come back to what this means and how we can do it from Hustle as well. You also have an upvoter component, which is like when I click on an upvote, there is the value changes over here eventually when the mutation. Right, is my voice audible? Yeah, I suppose. Awesome. So. Um, I've got the three votes now appearing over here. And uh, and this is happening because of the mutation that, that's going over here. Awesome, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna replicate the data models uh, for this. So we're not gonna write any code for the backend, but we're gonna use Hasura to, to create data models to replicate this list of posts and the authors and the voting uh, system. 
So let's go to create table. Um, we'll start off with the author table. We'll start off with the ID column with, uh, with an integer. We'll do first name type text and last name again type text. And here this camel casing is totally up to you. You can use camel casing or snake casing. Typically in, in SQL databases, we use um, underscore types, right? Uh, this camel casing is a JavaScript, uh, JavaScript world, people prefer this more. So I'm just going over the JavaScript world uh, where you have camel casing. Right, so we've created author table with three columns, the ID, first name, and last name, pretty standard uh, set of columns. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go to uh, this tab. We'll actually need the admin secrets. I'm going to actually copy this. So go here, X Asura admin secret. And I've copied this. And we can see that on the left on the Explorer, uh, some queries have popped up. We can auto complete on this GraphQL interface. So this is what I meant by self-serving API where um, the documentation is there for you and you just uh, explore the API from the docs. So this is the documentation explorer. There is a query, there's a mutation and subscription route uh, for your API. I want to click on the query route, um, which has a lot of fields. Uh, this has the author, and the author aggregate and author by PQ. So Hasura has generated these three uh, queries for you for the table that we created called author. So inside author, the response structure would be of this format. It's an array of author type. And if I go to the author type, it has these three fields, which, which are the columns that we created in, in Postgres. Right, so, uh, Clicking on the Explorer tab, we can see that ID, first name, last name. I can quickly autocomplete this. I'll close this documentation. I'll click on play. This data will be empty because we don't have any data right now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to insert an author. Um, I'm going to insert Chris to start with. And let's save. Now let's go back to the API Explorer and now query this. And we can see that the author that we inserted is now available on the GraphQL query. Awesome, so we've gotten the data from author uh, that we've inserted. Uh, we can also insert data from a mutation, which is to say, insert author one we give an object and if you are if you're unsure what you need to type in in the query in the mutation you can look at the docs or you can look at the explorer over here which is auto completing it for you automatically so again going back to the author first we have to give the values for these three fields right um, i want to give the ideas two for this user and let's pick our next set of users let's pick Rocco and I'm going to use Rocco's as the last name as well um, in this example and I need the ID back from the author right um, I'm going to do a mutation I've got the author inserted so let's go to the data tab let's go to author and we can see a Roku being inserted into the DB. So we have two users. Uh, we used a query to fetch data. We used a mutation to insert data. Awesome, so we have one table now. Let's also create another table required for our example, which is to list down the posts uh, by the author. So I'm gonna create a table called posts, which will have an ID again of type integer. And it will have title, which will be of type text. 
and it will have number of votes required uh, for each post. And it will also have a field called author ID, which will denote who was the author for this post. I'm going to select the primary key as ID and I'm going to click on add table. Now the next table uh, APIs will also be auto-generated, which is the post table. Right now, before we move ahead, uh, we we'll, we know that author table exists. We know that the author ID column has some relationship with author table because the integer value over here is just a value which will be inside the author table. Uh, right, so we have two authors over there already, and we want to just link it to them uh, for our existing posts. So on the reference table, so we're going to create a foreign key in Postgres, which will ensure that there is a constraint for the value. And, and based on that, Hasra will also suggest you relationships that you can create. Uh, so from author ID column in this table, I am going to establish a relationship to the ID column in the author table. I'm gonna click on save. Now the foreign key will be created. So this is all typical uh, Postgres uh, operations that you are doing through this UI. You can still totally do this through by directly communicating with your Postgres uh, database using PSQL or any RPG adminer um, or whatever tool that you are comfortable with to interact with Postgres. Right? This is just a, a fancy UI layer to interact with your DB. Now that you have the uh, foreign key constraint established, you can now do a relationship. Uh, the concept of relationship is that you can now fetch related data in the same query. Uh, and there are a couple of options to do that. Uh, one would be around object relationship and the other would be around array relationship. This is termed based on how you fetch data in your, uh, in your JSON object. If you have an object, it's like a simple object. If you have an array, you have an array of objects which uh, can hold multiple data, right? So in that, in and it's also like a one-to-one -one mapping versus one-to-many mapping. Uh, here, uh, each post will have one author. So we'll have an author relationship, uh, but each author can have multiple posts, all right? And in that case, if you go to author table, and relationships here, it will be such as array relationship because uh, one author can have multiple posts that you can save, right? So we've created both the relationships based on the foreign key that we created. Um, now the next step would be to obviously insert one post. So let's insert a post. Um, the ID would be one. Let's say first post in Angular Meetup. Uh, let's start with one vote and the author ID being one, which is Chris, right? So we have inserted this row. Now let's query this data. So we'll do query, uh, we can do post. It'll be ID, title, votes. And you can also fetch the author details in the same query. So this is a single query, single HTTP call. But if you look at the data that's coming here, you are getting the details of the post. You're also getting the details of the author in the same request. And, and this author is the author of this particular post. That's how we've tagged it, tagged it in the DB, right? So this is one query. Uh, this is nested query. This is a relationship query, however you term it. Um, but this is the power of GraphQL, right? Um, you can fetch data from uh, from a nested uh, field uh, structure, and then you'll be able to now uh, process this on your front end in a single JSON object. Awesome. So for the front end, for the Angular app, it doesn't matter where the data for this author came from or how the data was processed. All the front end app cares is that I've made a query, uh, slightly bigger query, but now I've got the response for this query in the same request. I'm not now making one query for post, one more query for author. That would be a lot of work on your front end. 
and typically uh, it's slower and it's also more boilerplate code on your front end so you are preventing both by introducing graphql's nested uh, query structure uh, which lets you do this and the interesting bit is that if your front end changes tomorrow if let's say your angular app doesn't want to showcase uh, the first the last name of the user it just wants to say hey the first name then you can remove that column and, and and graphql will ensure that you will not get the response for that column so you you're transferring lesser number of bytes over uh, over http so that will be faster for you as well so totally depends on what your application requires um and 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 you will change data or include or remove fields based on that right so now going back to um our apollo angular example over here and i'm going to go to the list component to see what the query looks like so if you look at the front end over here uh, what you're seeing here is uh, the post title followed by the author name who wrote the post followed by the number of votes that a particular post has gotten so the query looks like this which is post you have the id title votes you have the relationship author id first name and last name uh, we've created a data model which represents exactly this so i can quickly copy paste this and then show you that this will also work and there you go so you have one post angular meetup we have the first author chris lee coming up um do remember that we have a second user as well who doesn't have a post uh, assigned to so let's do that let's go to post let's do integer to second post um i'll start with one again and author id two this will be assigned to roko so Rocco's post will also now come up in the list of uh, posts. So we have a couple of data, right? Um, so this is what we've now implemented. Uh, we've implemented the query layer and uh, this should ideally work, right? Um, the next step would be the backend for your mutation, which is to say uh, what happens if I click on the upload button in your app. Uh, so it's it's so we've declared an upload method uh, which is using uh, Apollo dot mutate. So we'll again come back to what Apollo does for query and mutation. But typically the mutation is trying to uh, insert or update some data uh, based on some criteria. In this particular case, what we want to do is we want to upload data. Uh, when uh, when somebody clicks on this button. So there's a button on click. Uh, so you click uh, this button, you call this upward method and inside the upward method, you basically trigger an API call. Uh, this could be, uh, you can write a fetch API call over here, or Axios, whatever library framework you use, or you can, if, you, if you've declared an Apollo client uh, as we've done here, you can call Apollo.mutate followed by the mutation that we're going to declare, right? Um, I'm going to show you what the mutation for uh, incrementing a vote looks like. So we have, I'll quickly show the post query. We have ID, title, and votes, right? So we have votes one and one for both the posts. Now, what if I want to update the vote count by one every time I make a mutation call, right? So what I can do is um, update post by PK, which is the primary key of this. And there is this increment operator, which increments a given field by a value that you specify. So I'm going to use votes and increment it by one. And I also will set the PK columns, which is the uh, ID. Um, let me look at the documentation, which would be insert, sorry, update post by PK and the, the PK columns input would be just the ID. 
right so right bigger columns would be lt and the value would be one, which would be the first post. So we're going to update the votes for the first post. And I'll get back data for ID and votes again. And I'll do, yeah, I'll basically make this particular query and update vote is the name of the mutation type. So once I do this mutation and I get back data, the vote count has increased to two. This is because I have incremented vote by one over here. So let's say I increment this by two. Uh, we already have two, if I increment it by two, it should end up with four. So we can test it out and we have a vote count of four. So this is basically the incremental operator that we're going to make use of in this example. We just want to increment it by one for a particular ID. Now this ID is going to be dynamic. So we will replace this with post ID, uh, which will come in from a variable, all right? So our Angular app will supply this variable uh, when you're making this query. And this is of type integer. So we will make use of this uh, variable. This is the mutation that we will be using. Um, this is slightly different, so we'll have we'll do a re, we'll do a replacement of this uh, mutation as well. Awesome. So what we can do is we can delete this mutation, replace this mutation with this, and and things still do work. Um, right. Let's go to list component, and uh, this query should still continue to work. Let's go to GraphQL module. Um, in the URI, we need to now update it to the GraphQL endpoint that Hasuda has given you. And once you do this, a lot of things might break. So let's see. Um, I've now updated this. And now you don't see the data coming in, obviously. Um, the reason being, the error says extra sort of admin secret is required, but not found. Cool. So this is happening because uh, we 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 have the Hasura project configured with this admin secret by default. This is the admin secret. I, I suppose I don't want to show them, but this is the admin secret. And without this, you'll not be able to query this endpoint. Uh, but what are the what are the ways by which you can enable access to this queries and mutation for any public user who's who doesn't need to have access to this admin secret, who's just a user who's just browsing your website for on a public site, just viewing data, right? For that particular use case, um, you have something called uh, unauthorized role. So you will declare this uh, unauthorized role and you'll declare role called public. So let's give it a role called public where uh, any any user who's assigned this role called public or anybody who's not assigned any role uh, will get this uh, role called public automatically. And uh, we'll define permissions for this role called public. And then we'll basically let the user access data for the post and author table without any conditions, uh, without the need for the admin secret, and also allow them to do a mutation update uh, to, to the data. So let's go to author. Let's go to permissions. Let's declare a role called public. Um, they don't need to insert into author. They can select author without any checks. They can select all three columns. So you can save permissions. And you have a stick over here on select. So now any public user can select data from author table. The next step is post. Um, <clears throat> here, uh, we will allow them to select without any checks for all the blog posts they might write. The next step is to allow them to update the uh, data, which is to say you can upvote 
uh, a post uh, unlimited number of times but you can now do that only for the votes uh, column you will not be able to update the author of the or the title of the post arbitrarily by anybody who's not logged in or doesn't have the admin secret right so you're just allowing them to update the vote count uh, for any user who's unauthenticated so you click on save permissions and now if you actually go to the app and and do a different change and maybe save it off um you can now see the post actually coming in from hasura right uh, you can see the first post in angular meetup this was four votes second post by roko is one vote uh, i'm going to upload this and see if this is working we have two upvotes now um we can again make this three and we can check this uh data update by going to post and we can see that the votes have become 3 and this is this has remained 4 we can also change this to 5 and now come back here run the query again you can see that the votes have now become 5 and 3 so this is just a stack blitz demo of the angular app now let's look at what is happening in this uh, angular code um you as i mentioned before we have started off with an apollo client uh, to initialize like a graphql setup which lets you consume queries and mutations and subscriptions pretty easily uh, with this uh, sdk type uh, like client uh, without this also you will be able to make queries you will be writing them uh, and making a http call like a fetch api call um, and then you will typically make uh, a json request so in fact um if if i can show you the network tab of this when you are making the call you will be able to understand what's happening in the background right uh, i close this and i click on a port there is a graphql query that's being made to the angular meetup app right uh, it's it's a post request um and if i go to the request payload you can see that it's basically a json request that's being sent to the graphql endpoint uh it has an operation name update vote there is a query that's being sent which is the graphql query and there are variables which are being sent right so these are the three keys that are required for a graphql request to succeed uh especially the query key is mandatory operation name and variables are optional and you can send or ignore them right in this particular case we're sending a mutation and the response is again a json response uh, so you have a data you have an update post by pk followed by the id and votes column coming in the db so what you've done is uh, we have uh, established a simple graphql client which lets you do the querying and mutation pretty easily without writing a lot of code um the list component basically uh, on init it basically makes an apollo watch query which is basically the query that we made to fetch data from the db through hasura graphql uh and on the apporter component uh we are doing a mutate method which is uh, again a graphql mutation but in this case we will we'll, we'll change this mutation based on how that query should look like how that request should look like we try it out on graph iql first and then once it's working you copy paste that mutation over here you pass in the right variables uh, that this particular mutation gets uh, and then uh, the upload button functionality also now starts to work right the next step would be um if you want to now do a web socket connection where this data gets updated real time whenever there is a change of vote uh in the db and then you want to update this value real time on the ui uh the next step would be to now uh, import web socket link and then uh, you define a subscription query which will work right um to show a quick example um 
so we have this course on our learn tutorial which uh, integrates subscription with the angular apollo uh, it uses the subscription transport ws protocol uh, which uh, can be used there's also a newer library called graphql hyphen ws which is a newer standard spec for making real time queries with graphql so you can use that as well and hasura support that as well right so so in either case you will you will add this as a provider in your uh, in your angular app and in instead of the http link that we used uh, over here um we will now use the websocket link that we will import all right so we will import websocket link from the apollo client uh, <clears throat> uh, the latest version and then uh, you will define the URI, which instead of HTTP, it would be WS. Uh, so instead of this being HTTPS, uh, you will make a call to the WSS, which is the WebSocket version of the link, right? Awesome, so this is um, a demo, a simple, very simple demo that I wanted to quickly show. What we have seen is uh, creating tables, uh, creating some permissions, relationships, and we have uh, tried out graphical queries and mutations pretty quickly, All right? So going back to the challenges now, uh, from what you've seen in the app. On the developer side of things, uh, what are the challenges now that you'll be facing uh, is performance and caching. Uh, with GraphQL, these two are not straightforward to implement when you're writing your own server. Uh, right <clears throat> with performance you typically have to handle the n plus one problem where uh, when you are making the query for a uh, post and author in the same uh, request you have to make a join uh, an sql join internally or you will make separate queries for fetching authors separate query for fetching post you join the data in the back end and then send that data to the front end so that would become like an n plus one problem where performance will be hit and caching is a big problem on, on the server side because uh, previously you can cache api calls which are get requests uh, with rest apis and then you will cache the json data right with uh, graphql you only have a post request with the request body where caching doesn't work um, because you'll not be able to cache a single endpoint. GraphQL works on a single endpoint and you can, it doesn't make sense to cache that one particular endpoint. That's one challenge to look at. Um, and the other challenge is authorization itself. Um, right now, the demo that you saw with authorization is, um, is what Hasura gives you with uh, declarative configuration to declare a permission uh, for a role for a particular operation called insert or select. Uh, and then Hasura uh, takes care of applying the filters, right? But if you want to write your own code for this, uh, you have to write the logic of uh, this is the user, this user shouldn't have the right permissions for this particular field and so on. That's a lot of boilerplate code that you will end up writing eventually. On the operation side of thing, uh, since GraphQL is a single endpoint, it also means that it's a single point of failure because your, let's say your Angular app is now relaying on your uh, on your GraphQL API. If your endpoint is down, your entire app is down. Uh, whereas previously with the REST API, um, you had uh, certain endpoints could be down, uh, but your entire server was not down because uh, you were using different servers for different endpoints. And that could be a lot of other ways where you can take that back pretty quickly. But GraphQL is a single point of failure due to the nature of it being one endpoint, uh, right? And how do you do rate limiting? Uh, previously, you can you can limit based on the endpoint. With REST APIs, your app will have 10 different endpoints. So you will be able to do rate limiting based on this particular get request or a post request can be rate limited. With GraphQL, it's again a single endpoint, which again becomes a problem for doing rate limiting pretty easily. On the business side of things, what's the cost involved uh, for migrating to GraphQL? Um, as I mentioned before, um, GraphQL, it's not a comparison of GraphQL versus REST and it's not about migrating from REST, rewriting it to GraphQL. With GraphQL, you can 
uh, wrap your existing REST APIs on top and then use GraphQL for your front end uh, and abstract away the REST API behind the GraphQL layer uh, on, the, on the API gateway layer. And, and Hasura lets you do that pretty easily as well, where uh, your existing REST APIs can be mapped to GraphQL with, with, with actions. So you can define types or schema in the type system and then map it to your corresponding REST API. And then Hasura will give you a GraphQL API out of that. Uh, so the business cost is not very heavy if you compare it as a as an incremental adoption of GraphQL rather than like a complete rewrite of of the app, uh, both on the front and the back end. Right? Uh, on the front end, also uh, the GraphQL queries that you rewrote uh, will take a lot of time, uh, and and the state management will become difficult once you have a very large app as well. Some of the resources that I wanted to share, um, um, this is on the Hasra Learn portal, Hasra.io slash learn. We have like a bunch of free tutorials, uh, which you can try out. There's one for Angular as well, which uses the Angular Apollo module that I showed you today. Um, do check out, it's a full stack course where you can set up uh, a full-fledged real-time app from scratch. And do check out our docs for uh, trying out uh, the different features that we have at Thasura. And, and if you want a quick backend to try out, you can do it on cloud.thasura.io. But if you prefer the open source version, you can go to GitHub, Thasura slash GraphQL engine, and you'll be able to have a Docker Compose set up, up and running quickly on your local setup, right? Um, I have just one small announcement. Uh, we have like an enterprise GraphQL conference coming up next month, um, which is free to register and attend. Uh, and if you're interested in GraphQL, uh, if, you're in, if you're in the front end ecosystem, uh, feel free to join and you'll be able to get a lot of knowledge from the talks that we have lined up. And that's, that's it mostly from my side and I'm happy to take questions.